Kim Davis is an elected representative in the office of a registrar in one of the counties of Kentucky. She refused to marry some same-sex couples and got sent to jail, some would say for exercising her First Amendment rights. Planned Parenthood is an abortion agency in the United States that has been harvesting and selling human fetuses. There's lots of horrid video evidence of what they've been up to out there, so please be careful how you check this out on Google. In the first case, Kim Davis was imprisoned. In the second case, no action is going to be taken by police. Why is that? Well, it's because the decisions that people make have a tendency to unquestioningly reflect their underlying system of values. And modern, morally relativistic societies do not seem to be self-critically aware of that tendency. And neither do the Jewish leaders of Jesus' own day. They have their own preconceived set of values which prevent them seeing clearly the things they are missing about Jesus. And we also need to be self-critically aware of what it is that actually underlies the decisions we're making and the actions that we take. We'll come back to this problem by the end. But first, let's make sure we're understanding the passage we're looking at here correctly in Mark 14, 53 to 65. So what's happening here is this. Jesus has warned his disciples at the Last Supper that he would be betrayed by one of their number, betrayed and captured. Peter has so far, uniquely amongst the disciples, stuck to what he'd said, that he, he would never desert Jesus, but the others have deserted him. Betrayed, deserted, but Jesus has warned Peter that he is going to deny his Lord three times. Peter, however, follows Jesus at a distance when he's taken away from the Garden of Gethsemane. Taken by a cohort of the Temple Guard, as, as we saw last time, that had no idea what Jesus looked like, therefore had to be shown by Judas who Jesus was. People chosen for their loyalty to the Temple Guards, and people who didn't know Jesus, therefore showing no loyalty to him, having not been attracted to him, his personality, or his teaching. That's how Peter could get right into the heart of the situation in the courtyard of the high priest Caiaphas. He wasn't known by these people because they'd never been near Jesus. And that's how we have a really reliable account of what took place there, what went on from the heart of the enemy's territory at the heart of this Jewish trial, mock trial, of the Saviour. As we know, Peter, who was there, gave Mark the information that went into this Gospel, and this Gospel was written for threatened and persecuted believers in Rome. So here is what actually reliably happened, being given to us by an eyewitness of those events, writing it down for the sake of people who, who are encountering what it meant to be betrayed, deserted and denied, no doubt, as they went through the experience of persecution at the heart of the Roman evil empire. So, Jesus was seized by Caiaphas's loyal bodyguard, taken to the well-defended, if not fortified, large house where Caiaphas was based. And there was a large hall there in the style of a posh Roman houses of the day. And, and gradually the people who constituted the three sectors of the Jewish ruling council turned up there. There were the high priests, in the plural, because Annas came, the retired high priest as well as Caiaphas. Then there were the lay elders of the people. Then there were the teachers of the law, the group that Saul of Tarsus belonged to in the Sanhedrin. Uh, there's nothing to say that he himself was part of these proceedings at these, this stage, but he was certainly one of those guys. And Peter is there amongst them. And from where he is warming himself at the fire, amongst the temple guard who sees Jesus, unbeknown to them, Peter gets a pretty good handle on what goes on. Now, the way a Jewish trial worked out was like this. 
witnesses came forward, made accusations. The defendant did what he or she could to discredit the testimony of those witnesses, and the elders then gave their judgment corporately on the matter. There was no prosecutor as such. It was down to these witnesses. And as one witness after another came forward, and one said this and one said that, as they were then cross-examined, nobody could agree. There was no account. There was nothing found against Jesus. He was found guiltless of all the accusations that were made against him. Now, false testimony is clearly prohibited in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 16. So the Jewish leaders had to be careful not to be seen to act against Jesus in clear violation of their own law. Isn't it wretched when people do this to you? They bring false accusations against you? Isn't it difficult to deal with and put up with? But Jesus, undergoing such things, and here's an example for those persecuted believers in Rome, Jesus said nothing. He kept quiet. At the end of the day, one specific allegation did emerge. Curiously, it was about bricks and mortar, but again, it didn't stick. Jesus had spoken about the future of the temple, and some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Now, at that time in Judaism, there was a belief that the existing temple was to be replaced with a new one in the last days. And whilst this was normally thought to be the work of God himself, there were some who thought the rebuilding task would be the task of the Messiah. The point is, though, that even when they thought there was some sort of tangible allegation to get hold of against Jesus, their testimony did not agree, and there was nothing they could get hold of to successfully accuse the Saviour of wrongdoing. So the high priest himself drew himself to his feet in a last-ditch attempt to get the Lord to testify consistently about himself. The high priest is clearly frustrated, exasperated by Jesus' lack of response to the malicious, life-threatening allegations that have been made against him. Because everything human in us wants to refute unjust allegations against us, and immediately. But Jesus is actually still passionate that the scriptures would be fulfilled and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 7 is silent before his accusers he was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. The high priest was clearly annoyed, frustrated, angry. And what we get now then is the old style, outward but not inward, theoretical but not real high priest going up against Jesus, the great high priest over the household of God. And this is it. This is the revelation of what has not been said openly, but it has always been the point of what Mark is saying and where his gospel is going from chapter 1. The Jerusalem high priest's question lays it all bare. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Again, they're questioning two things, his identity and his authority to say and do the things that he's been saying and doing. They have since chapter 11, at least. And now he speaks. Now he who has been silent speaks out, and he, he, he did not speak in self-defence, but he will speak out to declare his saving identity and authority as he proclaims to Caiaphas the dawn of the kingdom of God. Here's what he's got to say. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Firstly, he says, I am. I am. Those words ring down the ages from Jehovah's def definitive self-proclamation to Moses at the burning bush in Genesis 3.14. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Second thing Jesus uses his preferred identity description for himself throughout this gospel, and having said that he is I am, he then says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. 
Now, there are two Old Testament scriptures being referred to here, Psalm 110, verse 1, but more explicitly, Daniel 7, 13. In Daniel 7, there it was the prophet who saw the Son of Man. Now it will be Jesus' self-appointed judges who will themselves see the Son of Man. And there's plenty in this claim for the Sanhedrin to chew on if they want to accuse Jesus of wrongdoing. Here's Daniel 7. It says this, He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now that's what Jesus is claiming here of himself. Firstly, I am. Secondly, I am the Son of Man. And given that the very purpose of the Sanhedrin's meeting was to question his authority and do away with Jesus, this is a very bold thing that Jesus declares here. Why? Firstly, it's a bold thing because Daniel saw the Son of Man given authority, sovereign authority, in the cosmos. And then secondly, because Daniel saw all nations and people of every tongue, not just the Jews, worshipping the Son of Man, which is who Jesus says that he was. And then thirdly, Daniel saw the Son of Man being given an everlasting kingdom that will never be destroyed. Huge claim. Claim that sets out in chapter 1 verse 15 has been shown by Jesus up to chapter 8 verse 28 to 32 to be true of him. Daniel saw the Son of Man given that everlasting kingdom that will never be destroyed. Huge claim. And the third thing. The third thing. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So you... This gathering of the Sanhedrin who plotted Jesus' demise and think you'll finish him off quietly, you'll see him coming back as obviously and as openly as if he were riding on the clouds like some ancient Near Eastern warrior deity from the depths of pagan epic Canaanite mythology. This is not a reference necessarily to his future coming. These are the guys that will see his coming back when he rises, appears and preaches again. And embarrassingly for them, his grave stays empty. They will see it in the next six weeks. They won't be able to sweep him from history as they think they shall. It shall be as obvious as if he was coming riding on the clouds of heaven. He won't be acting privately. And the next six weeks or so will be hugely revealing. You can't sweep God under the carpet. You can't sweep Jesus under the carpet. You can't sweep Jesus under the carpet because Jesus is God. And here he tells the high priest in terms that he will fully understand that that is who he is. So as Dick Franz says in his commentary, with this verse we come to the Christological climax of the Gospel. The time for concealment is over and the truth must be declared firmly and openly to those who presume them to set themselves up as judges over Jesus. What are the issues at stake here? Jesus is out in the open now. He is the awesome God the Son, the ruler of the universe. Why is it that people can't see that? Why is it that they don't bow the knee and acknowledge his authority? When they're shown this in their prophetic writings going back to Daniel, these guys, well trained religiously, as they can't, they can't see it. Why is that? So, in terms of conclusion, what do we learn from the Jewish leaders' mistakes? What do we learn about Jesus? In terms of the Jewish leaders, it's important to recognise this. Presuppos presuppositions that you've got prejudice your perspective. That high priest. Here's what Jesus has got to say, and it's borne out by Jesus' life, Jesus' pattern of teaching, and the Old Testament scriptures. But they've got presuppositions that mean they can't see it straight. And they're not ready to examine those presuppositions. So the high priest hears what Jesus has got to say, rips his garment and says, this is blasphemy. Well, for an ordinary man to say that, it would be blasphemy. But Jesus has spent quite some time showing he's no ordinary man. The presuppositions of God in the way. And there's this quote that came up recently from John Stott. If we come to scripture with our minds made up, and that's, that's not 
the, the, the overriding thing, but this next thing is, expecting to hear from Scripture only an echo of our own thoughts and never the thunderclap of God's thoughts, then indeed he will not speak to us and we shall only be confirmed in our own prejudices. Now that's important, isn't it? That's, that's the mistake the high priest Caiaphas made. We must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, to undermine our complacency and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behaviour. Why? Because what's scripture for? All scripture is God-breathed. We all know that from 2 Timothy 3.16, right? We know that verse. And is useful. Yeah, we know that bit. What's it useful for? For teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Why? Because we're a bit of a wild vine and we need to be trained. <laughs> it's there for that for us. For our benefit, for our good and for our fruitfulness. So there's that <coughs> re-examination. This was in the introduction. But the re-examination of ourselves in the light of Scripture on a regular basis. And we have to do it. And, you know, we've had a conversation even this morning. I've been saying, Helen, I haven't been concentrating on this aspect, this theme. I should pay more attention to this and so on and so on and so on um, because that's the process we come to God he teaches us from his word corrects us and leads us the first mistake the Jewish leaders are making is about their presuppositions prejudicing their perspective I have to warn you I wrote this little bit when I was tired yeah so <laughs> so volition violates veracity by which I mean to say if you want it to be such and yon, then there's a great tendency to see things that way. Does that make sense? You know, in English, when translated out of the whatever I wrote on there. Yeah. Jesus goes through the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays and he prays and he prays, says, Lord, take this cup from me. And we can all <coughs> identify with that prayer. But then he says, not my will, but your will be done. That's a big deal. Guys, we've got to stick to that. Those guys are not happy with that. Those guys at that temple have got it all the way they want it. It's running nicely and Jesus comes along and disturbs it. Your will, not my will be done. And testing, testing things again, questioning yourself, you know, examining your presuppositions, it seals the testimony to truth. So testing what Jesus is claiming against what he did. Does he look like God? Does he sound like God? Does he act like God? Does he come up with the cookies? Yes. It's not a matter just of Bible and my understanding. It's a matter of that Bible working in my daily experience in life, isn't it? Word and Spirit testify. The Word and the Spirit testify. So there's a couple of things that we really need to watch out for. Um, the mistakes of the religious leaders in dealing with Jesus. But what do we learn about Jesus? Because this is going to get more helpful and encouraging. Um, what Jesus does throughout here, he, he's just passionate that the scripture should be fulfilled. And reading through again afresh, how long have I been reading this Bible? Uh, since 1976 at least. How long is that? It's ages, isn't it? That's why I've got no hair. No, it's not why I've got no hair. It's not the Bible bit, it's the age. It, you're okay on that? Okay. So it's not reading the Bible that loses your hair, it's actually living that long. Um, again, a fresh has come to me in a, in a new understanding of the way that Jesus is passionate throughout his passion about being meticulous, doing things the way so that the Bible comes right, that the scripture might be fulfilled. What he does is driven by this passion that the scripture should be fulfilled. The first thing we learn about Jesus is his governing passion. Secondly, we learn this, this thing about who Jesus is. He's the Holy One. And all these guys who've had every opportunity and have got all the brain power in the world to apply to it, they cannot seem to convict him. They, they, they go about trying to catch him out. They go about, he's the Holy One. People throw muck at Jesus. It won't stick. He's kind of Teflon. Well, we, we, what we say is, we say he's sinless the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And how important is that? Because unless Jesus has got no sin of his own that he's got to die for, then he can't put his perfect record against people who have got sins of their own to die for and take their sins to himself because he's too busy having to die for his own sins. Is that making sense? 
the wages of sin is death, yeah? But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And if he's going to do that swap, my sin for his perfect record of righteousness in the heavenly mm, register, if you see it like that, he needs to be that sinless one. He's the sinless one. They can't make it stick on him. The Holy One. I am the Almighty Holy God. And what you will see, what is not necessarily so plain and evident, you, you, you will see. You will see the Son of Man coming in glory. He's writing, Mark is writing, for Christians in Rome, persecuted, subjugated, pushed to one side. They're not, they're not on the up. You're going to see the Son of Man coming in glory. What looks so unreal now in this world that gives you such a false impression is coming in glory, riding on the clouds of heaven, like Daniel, son of man, entering the throne room of the Most High, the Ancient of Days, coming to sit on the throne of God. The Jesus you follow, the Jesus you're passionate about, passionate about following, is the one who is the ruler of the ends of the earth. Put your trust in him. Amen.